For Crema Media's Polity, I'm Shannon Durehove. Author Susan Newham-Blake joins me to discuss her book, Making Finn, about her unconventional journey to motherhood. The story of your journey to motherhood is deeply personal. What made you want to share it with the public through a book? Right. Um, well, actually, I'm a, I've been a magazine journalist for many years, so I'm a writer, and obviously I always had a dream, as many writers do, to write a book. Um, after you know, going through my journey of conceiving my, uh, my family, I, I realized that a lot of people were really interested in the story, so I was getting requests. Um, I, I'd, be, you know, I'd start telling somebody that I had kids and how, how we had conceived them, and they'd just want more and more information. So I realized that it was obviously there was quite a lot of interest in um, sh um, the actual story. Um, so I decided to write a book. and. The main thing that possibly got me through to the end of the book is that it's quite a unique conception story for my um, children and I wanted to record it for them. I wanted to record it as I remembered it happening. Um, and so that's sort of really what got me to writing to the end. Of course, I, while I was writing it, I didn't really think that it was going to get published. And even after Penguin contacted me and said they would publish it, I didn't really think that anyone would read it. So there was a moment after it had been published that I thought, oh my goodness, what have I done? I've written this deeply personal story and I just wanted to cra crawl under a rock and um, disappear. But um, that, that is really, I, I think, you know, having the story out there has also been very rewarding in the sense that I think a lot of people have also kind of been helped by this by, by my journey, so that's felt um, very rewarding that I've been able to share it. But primarily, I did write it for my children, so that they would know their story and that, and that they would know how much they really had been wanted and also how they had been considered in the process. What advice would you impart to couples that are considering donor insemination? Um, I mean, my instinct is just to say, go for it. You know. Um, it is a big decision, and it is, you know, it is. There are a lot of considerations. I think, though, that if I know, knew then at the beginning of the journey what I know now, I probably wouldn't have been so angsty about it and so anxious about it, um, and I would have just trusted that it was going to be all right because it has actually turned out to be a really incredible um, experience. But I do, you know, personally, I think that it's important to always consider the children. So obviously um, bringing children into the world, you know, wittingly, knowingly that they're not going to necessarily know who their biological father is, um, needs to be considered. And um, I think, you know, knowing that they won't have a father necessarily, or no matter how you do it, knowing that they're going to, that you're going to use a known donor or that, that person, how that, what that role that person is going to play in their life, that stuff, I, I would advise needs to be, you know, like thought through before the children are there, preferably. Um, at some point, you're going to have to think, think through it. But I, my feeling is that if you're okay with it and you've made peace with the reality of what your family is and who they are and what they are capable of and not capable of, um, you know, that, that will certainly rub off on your children. Your, you know, if you're proud and um, fine about who your family is, they will be proud and fine as to who their family is. Um, you know, for us, it was very important that to use an identity release donor so that our children could have more um, knowledge about their genetic material and was a, that was available um, from an anonymous donor. Um, and, but that was a personal decision and you know I, I, I certainly think that people make their own decisions given their own ser set of circumstances and what feels possible for them and a lot of people you know choose a to adopt because they couldn't do do something like that. So you know everybody's um, decisions need to be respected. But I, I, you know I think it's it's good to think through them. Um, and yeah, you know, as I said, just go for it if you want if you if you want to. You know. How did you cope psychologically through this process, especially the negative comments and harsh reactions? Well, to be honest. Um, you know, I did, uh, we didn't really come across many negative comments or harsh criticisms at all. Um, you know, I think we've, Roxy and I have both been very open about who we are. We've also both worked very hard to be okay with who we are and made peace with that. Um, and, you know, I think that we've lived in the world like that. So I, there, was, there were no secrets. When, you know, I had a, my, at my job, I have a career from my boss to whoever, this, you know, the receptionist, everyone knew that I was trying for a baby this way and certainly people were just mostly very, very supportive and quite delighted in the story. Um, 
you know, there, we have obviously had the odd comment um, where people might have said something like, you know, um, I, don't, I don't think it's right for gay people to bring children into the world. And, you know, that's more of a reflection on who they are than who we are. And, you know, I'm, I, I, I disagree with that. Um, so, you know, I think that it's a bit about developing a, a thick skin, but obviously hurtful comments are hurtful and there have been the odd comment that, ha you know, that has obviously be been hurtful, but it, it, is, it is the reality of our situation. I think my belief that, um, you know, we're doing the right thing and, um, and, and also just kind of in a way putting ourselves out there in the hope that it will help change people's perceptions of who gay people are or whatever it happens to be, but, you know, change people's prejudices, that that gives me a lot of strength to keep going. But it was difficult, you know, certainly, you know, I really struggled with the concept of using an unknown, you know, this anonymous donor to create a family. It felt like I was in some kind of peculiar surreal movie that um, you know, it wasn't. It, it, it took a lot of processing to to feel okay with that, and and still sometimes I think it seems quite bizarre. But um, it was what we needed to do to create the family, and um, yeah. So I mean, it had. There were definitely very very difficult times, but yeah, I think what pulled me through was just knowing that it was right, and I'm certainly very very glad that I did go through with it. What was the most difficult aspect of this journey? I think just deciding on how, um, you know, I think that I knew I wanted to have children. I think just making the decision of how to have them. Um, you know, we considered adoption, we considered using a known donor, we cons you know, anonymous donor. And in South Africa, anonymous donors really, you had very little information about the child. Um, you really were never going to be able to know more than what was on a very small piece of paper, you know, height, weight, skin colour and interests, and that was it. And I really struggled to kind of feel okay about any of those one ways of having um, a child. And I think, you know, you brought up in a world where that nuclear family is absolutely celebrated and, you know, kind of revered, and that is what is the epitome of what a successful family looks like. So that is what we all have internalised inside our brains, that this is, you know, the, the only right way to create a family is through, you know, married, devoted um, male-female couples. So, you know, anything that isn't that feels very hard to go against that. And so I think that was a very difficult process to come to terms with. Um, and then, of course, what we did discover was that there were, were what was called identity release donors um, in, the, in, the, at, in sperm banks in the States. And they were, um, you know, where the child, when they turned 18, could find out who their biological father had been. And this um, just seemed like a really good compromise for us. And that was, you know, something that we then landed up uh, considering and doing it that way. It must have also been quite difficult because South Africa is generally very conservative. Again, I was, you know, the whole journey from the um, very hel helpful customs official on the other side of the customs helpline, who I had to try and explain to him why I wanted to bring sperm from the United States of America to South Africa. And he said to me, but can't you get that kind of stuff in South Africa? You know, that... Um, I, I just, I, we just really did find people were generally quite eager to help us. I mean, the freight company that kind of mostly just brings in textiles from overseas had also kind of, the guy drove his, his car to the airport in Cape Town and went to the customs officials and physically brought us the container um, from Cape Town International to my home on a Saturday morning with his daughter sitting in the car. So and gave me a big hug and said, you know, good luck. So it, I, I know it's, I know that people find it, you know, that it's, that it isn't the norm. Um, and, but, but people were very genuinely, you know, caring. The fertility clinic, clinic were, was fantastic. Our gynecologist was fantastic. The, you know, everybody that we've come across along the journey has been really great. Now that Finn is five and a half and he's in um, grade R and preschool, his teachers are fantastic. The principal of the school is fantastic. You know, the, the, the school he's going into next year for grade one have been really embracing. You know, that is what we feel. That is our experience in the world that we're currently living in. So we, I, I, I'm, I feel like maybe we're not as conservative um, as we think we are. And, 
you know, I also think that there are a lot more people doing this than just Roxy and I. And certainly I've met women who've got families that are much older than us that have used sperm donation 10 years ago, you know, who have three daughters or, and we've only just started meeting them through the book and they've heard about us and they might have been living two streets away. Um, and, you know, also fertility treatment in general is very common. So I've also had lots of straight couples uh, contact me and say they've fallen pregnant using an egg, don uh, egg donor. Um, they might not necessarily tell all their friends and family about it. You know, we had to because we were two women, so we couldn't pretend anything. But I think there are a lot of straight couples that, due to fertility issues, actually do use egg donors and sperm donors who've contacted me and told me and, you know, shared their stories with me. So, um, yeah, we just happen to be gay, but I think, you know, in vitro or whatever, artificial insemination is almost becoming really commonplace. A lot of families are created that way these days. and however many years ago, that also seemed really strange and unusual. So, you know, I think South Africa will continue to become more open-minded to these things. You end your story with the simple sentence that Jet's birth, your second son, is another story. Can we expect a second book from you? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question and there is a second book. Um, not that it's been written yet, but there's a, there's a second story. Um, you know, Jet was conceived very similarly to Finn, so it isn't really that story of how Jet was conceived. He was conceived with the same donor as Finn, in the same way as Finn was conceived, Roxy um, carried him. And, um, you know, we both had very similar pregnancies and, you know, gave birth naturally and all that kind of thing. So the, the stories are quite um, similar, but I, I suspect that the second story is a lot more about um, family dynamics and what it's like for two women to raise a family and the kind of parenting roles that um, people take on and um, yeah so but I do think that the second book is, is quite a lot more difficult to write because as the boys get older you know they're more aware and and it's a lot more personal and it's, it involves them much more directly than what just making them you know which was involving us two adults making this decision um, so we'll have to see, actually. Um, there, there's certainly another story out there, but we'll see whether I ever get to write it. But there has been a lot of requests about writing it. I am writing other books, though, okay. so, um, but um, more fiction-type stories and that kind of thing, that in a similar t sort of style as, uh, as the non-fiction, but sort of just you know, doing fiction instead. Yeah. Well, that sounds very exciting, and I look forward to reading those, too. That was author Susan Newham-Blake discussing her book, Making Finn.